What's up everybody, it's Mr. Herzl and I'm going to walk you through the seven principles of the Constitution. So whether um, this is for review or this is your first time hearing it, most likely it's going to be your first time hearing it, um, I will teach you the seven principles of the Constitution and get you all set up for next week and for your eventual test. Alright, as always we start with the teaks for the week. And this week, again, we're going to talk about the uh, uh, principles in the Constitution. Principles means like the things that the Constitution is about. Um, things inside the Constitution that basically are the way that our government is run. So you see there, these are the things we're going to be talking about today. Um, limited government, republicanism, checks and balances, federalism, separation of powers, popular sovereignty, individual rights. It sounds like a lot of mumbo jumbo. You probably don't know what any of those are right now. I promise you they're super simple. And uh, once I explain them to you, you'll go, oh, okay, uh, you know, that's not so hard. Um, and then summarize the purpose for and process of amending the Constitution. We're not going to do that in this lecture, but you'll get to learn that during class this week. Okay, so the first one we're going to talk about is popular sovereignty. Nothing is more important than popular sovereignty. Um, in the Constitution. So the definition of popular sovereignty is the belief that the government is created by and for the people and that the people are the source of all political power uh, and those people get to choose people to represent them. Okay, so let me break that down for you a little bit more. Okay, you cannot have a government, a free government, if the government is um, run by a king or run by a dictator or something like that. A free government means that the people are the government. We are the government. You are the government. Um, and so what that means is that uh, if you're the government, right, like you and all the other people who live in this country are, if we put us all together, that we are the government. Um, what that means is that we get to make decisions for what we want in our country. That's popular sovereignty, the people's choice. Now, we don't do that through us individually choosing every uh, everything. Like if there's a, a law that needs to be made, we don't get to vote on the laws. Um, sometimes we get to vote on certain things, but that's you don't need to, to worry about that. What, what popular sovereignty means is that we, the government is the people, so that's us, okay? And then we get to choose people to represent us and make laws and decisions for us okay so you see this quote here Benjamin Franklin in a free government in free government the rulers are the servants and the people their superiors and sovereigns so we are the the people are the important uh, thing in our government right not the rulers the rulers serve us they're the servants of the people um, and so don't ever forget that a lot of times we separate out the government and we think that the government is this like powerful um, thing that's above us and that's not true like we are the government um, always remember that that is very important in a free society um, at the bottom there it says everyone in a free country is the government and that means the people have the ultimate power we're going to talk about so popular sovereignty later um, when it comes to the the lead up to the civil war um, and in that case it just means that people got to decide whether they wanted to be a slave state or a free state popular sovereignty the people are sovereign the people have the ultimate power very important that's the number one thing that you need to know about our government the people are the most important part okay limited government sorry I didn't uh, I didn't put up the entire slide there while I was talking so you might have to go back and pause it and to fill in the blank. So I apologize, I won't do that anymore. Um, okay, limited government. The government had no power before the people gave, uh, gave it power in the Constitution, um, and it doesn't have any power that the people didn't give it in the Constitution. Like, it can't do anything that the people didn't give it in the Constitution. Okay, so let me break that down for you again. So... The government is created by the people. Remember, popular sovereignty. People are the most important thing, right? So we created the Constitution, meaning people in the United States back in the day created the Constitution, okay? They created the government, 
And so away from the people, the government has no power. We give the government power, okay? The government doesn't give us power. The government doesn't give us rights. We give the government power. Um, we give them the ability to do things, okay? And the way that we give that to them is through the Constitution, okay? So a group of people got together and said, we represent the people of the United States, and we're going to create the Constitution, and we're going to give it power, all right? And so the government is completely limited to that power. It can't do anything that the people don't say it can do in the Constitution, right? And you can change, we can change the Constitution. If we wanted to, we could change the entire Constitution in this country. Why? Because people have the ability through popular sovereignty, right, to give the government power. But the government always is limited to the power that it has. Um, and it can't do anything that the people don't say it can do, okay? Um, so, and again, how do we how do we tell it what it can do? Well, it's the Constitution. We gave we have the Constitution. We can change the Constitution. The Constitution has been changed multiple times, um, and so that is limited government. the The opposite of a limited government government is the second thing here, where the founding fathers, you know, they went through a government system that was, um, you know, not limited, and that was the crown in England, the king. And the king basically could do whatever he wanted. The people didn't have a say. Um, and so they wanted to create a government where the, the government didn't have, like, they couldn't do whatever it wanted. If the government said, we want to take your land, like, they can't just do that. Or the government says, hey, like, you know, we're, we're going to make you be, I don't know, a, a blacksmith, right? Like, it, it can't do that. Um, it's limited in what it can do and what it can't do. Okay. Okay, Republicanism. Republicanism does not mean like uh, the party system that we have today, Democrats and Republicans. Republic Republicanism is this idea that um, people vote for local individuals to go represent them at the federal level, and then those people go and make laws. Okay, so if you go, let's start at the bottom here, where it says, in a pure democracy, everyone votes, right? So like in a pure democracy, if we had a pure democracy, if there was a law that was going to say um, ban driving more than 30 miles an hour on the highway, if we somebody thought that was a good idea, well then, if in a pure democracy, every person in the United States would have the ability to vote on that on that issue, but we're not a pure democracy, okay? Like if somebody says that we live in a democracy, they're not they're not right. We live in a representative democracy, okay? So like you have the ability to vote. You, you will have the ability to vote when you turn 18, um, and, but you're not voting for every individual law that's made at the federal level. What you're voting for is someone to represent you at the federal level and make those laws. So we vote for someone local. That local person goes to Washington, D.C., becomes a part of the Congress. That Congress makes laws. Okay, So that is a Republican style government, republicanism, that's republicanism. Now why did the founding fathers do that? Well they did it because number one, they didn't have any representation when they were colonists. And number two, even when they, you know, even people who were in England, they didn't get to choose who the representative was. Uh, a lot of times those positions were given by birthright. Um, they were given to people who were, you know, had a lot of money um, or had a lot of status in society. Okay, so again, republicanism, is that you are going to vote for a representative, a person who's going to represent you at the federal level, okay? It's gonna to go to Washington, D.C., and then that person, together with all the other representatives, is gonna vote for you, okay? Not a pure democracy. We are a, a democratic republic, republicanism. Okay, let's talk about federalism. Okay, federalism, super, super important to the way that our government is set up. This, this might be like, other than popular sovereignty, this might be the thing that is the most important for you to understand. Okay, power is shared by the state and the federal government. Power will always be shared by the state and the federal government. 
So again, like the state government is the state of Texas, our government down in Austin, the people who represent you in Austin and make laws. The federal government is Washington, D.C., who makes laws for all of the states to follow. Okay, so we work in a system where it's not just like one group of people making all the laws for the United States. Okay, we work in a system where we have state laws that are made and we have federal laws that are made. Okay, and so like that's re that gets really confusing when we teach uh, people about government. Um, but it's really not it, it's not that confusing if you understand federalism. Okay, so the federal government is given power by the people. Um, through popular sovereignty um, and it is given limited power, limited government through the Constitution. So the federal government can only do what is in the Constitution. Okay? It can't do anything else. All other power is given to the states. Okay? So the Founding Fathers said we want to create a system with a very small government so we're going to give it only these limited amount of responsibilities and rules and then everything else will be decided by the states. All right? So they share responsibility. That is federalism. Federalism is powers, power being shared by federal and state governments. Okay? Um, so powers for the national government are delegated powers. So that means that we delegate, we give the federal government certain powers. Okay? And why do we do that? Because certain, you know, like if, if we had no federal government and each state got to make its own rules about everything, well, that wouldn't work. Like we would all have a, a different money system and we would all be fighting about, you know, who trades one state trading with another state and how much they should charge for taxes trading with that state. And, and then what about war? Like if we had to go to war, how would we organize all that? So there are certain things that we said, this is, this is better if it, this is better if it's controlled by the federal government, okay? So if they have power over all the states, if they say, listen, um, you know, uh, you can only have one set of currency, which means money system, um, something like that. Or, hey, you know, if you're going to trade across state lines, you can't charge extra money to do that. Um, so just things like that uh, that are in the Constitution. Those are the things that are given in the Constitution. Now, other things are better for state. Uh, for the states to make laws about. Actually, most things are better for the states to make laws about, right? Because each individual state is different. Each individual state has different needs. And so the Founding Fathers created this ingenious system where states got to make their own laws and then, then uh, because there are certain things that are better for states to make, laws are better for states to make, and then the federal government got to make their own laws as well. Uh, because certain things are better if it's done at the federal level in Washington, D.C. All right, powers for the state government are reserved powers. They are reserved for the states. And shared powers are concurrent powers. Okay, separation of powers. The federal government is divided into three branches. So, like, you should know this from elementary, but it's okay if you don't, like maybe you forgot, not a big deal. We have the executive, the legislative, and the judicial branch. Um, it prevents any one branch from gaining too much power and taking over the country, okay? So the executive branch is the president, the legislative branch, and we're talking about the federal government here, right? Because the constitution is in charge of the federal government. So at the federal level, we have the executive, who's the president, we have the legislative, who's con the Congress and the Senate, and then we have the judicial, and the, the top of the judiciary is the Supreme Court, all right? So all three of those have power, okay? All three branches have power, but they're separated, okay? So that they, um, that no one group of people have all the power in the country. Super important. So they can't just do, you know, like if the president had all the power, he could just do whatever he wanted and basically take over the country, right? And thwart the will of the people, basically go against what the people wanted and do whatever he, whatever he chose to do. And so the founding fathers, again, they set up the system where um, it protects against what happened in England where the, the king had all the power. 
and they said, you know, they knew that some governments, it's not just the king who has all the power. Sometimes it's the military, or sometimes it's the judges, or sometimes it's the uh, legislative branch. So they created a system with three different branches who all have power um, and who can all um, give checks on each other's power, which we're going to talk about in a second. That's the next thing we're going to talk about, so let's go to that. Okay, checks and balances. So those three branches of government, remember what are they? Executive, legislative, and judicial, right? They are given certain powers that check the other people, the other uh, branches of government. And what do I mean when I say check? Well, it basically means that no, it, it keeps any one branch from gaining too much power, all right? So to function correctly, for the country to work correctly, um, all three of these branches have to be kind of in agreement on things. If you said, hey, um, you know, if a bill becomes law, for a bill to become law, all that has to happen is the president has to say, I want to make a bill law, I'm going to do it. Well, the president would have all the power. He could do whatever he wanted. He could make whatever laws that he wanted, right? And the founding fathers said, eh, that's not a good idea. Let's make it so no one person has complete power. So the president um, is there, Congress is there, and then the judiciary. And an example of this um, is, and, and we'll talk about the ones on the bottom. And, well, yeah, let's go to the one on the bottom. So bills have to be passed by the House of Representatives. Okay? They have to be, so the House of Representatives has to all agree, all of your representatives, all the representatives from the country um, have to get together and vote, and they have to have a majority agree that the bill is good for the country. So they're going to all agree. And then it's going to be sent to the president, and the president can veto it. So he can say, I don't like this bill, um, and he can shut it down, or he can sign it. And then on top of that, later on, the Supreme Court of the United States, the judiciary, can decide if the law is constitutional or not. Right? So each of them have to work together to make that happen. And if any one says, ah, this isn't good for the country, then they can shut it down. Right? So that is a system that, that basically keeps any one branch of government from taking over control of the country or having too much power. And it also makes sure that when we have laws and things that uh, our country, our federal government does, uh, it, it makes sure that they're in the best interest of the country. Another example there is federal judges are nominated by the president, but they have to be approved by Congress. So the president can't just decide who he wants and say, well, that's it. You know, uh, no other branch of government gets to have a say. Um, no, the Congress, the Senate has to do that. So if you heard about Kavanaugh um, being nominated to the Supreme Court, why was there this big ruckus? It's because the, the, uh, the Senate was having to confirm him, and so they had arguments about whether they, they should confirm him or not. But again, the president made the decision to nominate him. President Trump made the decision to nominate Kavanaugh, and then they had to confirm and say, yeah, like we agree that this guy's good for the country, um, which they eventually did. Okay, and last but definitely not least, uh, this is the foundation of everything we've talked about, is individual rights. So why do I say that? that's the foundation of everything we've talked about? Because individual liberty is what leads to all of these things and, and all of the things that we've talked about, separation of power, checks and balances, federalism they are all to protect individual rights so you have rights that are given to you by God that no one can take away no no they can't be given to you by anyone else and they can't be taken away so a lot of times the people are like oh well the government lets us do this the government lets us you know do whatever if you want to name a law or a rule or whatever but that's not the case, okay? You have in you have rights that are given to you by God, right? The government did not give them to you. So the founding father said, if they're given by God, if our rights are given to us by God, then how in the world could a government take them away? Government should never be able to take away individual rights, okay? Why? Because the government 
can't give rights and it can't take them away. They're given to you by God. Right? Those are called inalienable rights. And the entire system of the Constitution is built around the idea of an individual's inalienable rights. Rights given by God. Okay? Um, and so we're going to get into this in ne uh, next week and the week after about the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments to the Constitution. Um, and there's going to be this big fight with after the constitutional convention where they write the constitution there's going to be this big fight in the united states about whether the constitution is good enough or not whether they need to add some things to it which are called amendments um, and the argument is basically saying that there's not enough protection of individual rights in the constitution okay and so eventually they're going to add things to the Constitution. And once they add those things, then all the states say, okay, good. Now that you've added these protections of inalienable rights, um, we will sign off on the Constitution. Okay, but we're going to get that, to that later. Hopefully you understand the principles of the Constitution better. Um, if you have any questions about it, ask your teachers. They know a lot about this subject. This is usually one of the favorite subjects of... Um, of teachers when it comes to social studies teachers. So until next time, I hope you guys have a good week and work hard, keep studying, and I will see you later.